يا بنات سامين يا بنات حلوين يا بنات إلا أنت يلا يا حلوة يا معلمة Hello, I'm Hotep and welcome. I'm Mog Morgan and this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. Today I'm going to talk about the subject of Zar, uh, spelled Z-A-R, which is a topic that often comes up in things connected with magic. Uh, some people know what that's about and some people kind of give me blank stares and say, Zah, what's that? So I thought it was a good time to set out some of the research and things that I've discovered about uh, Zah from various sources. Zah is uh, the name of an exorcism dance tradition known commonly from Egypt, Egyptian Zah. Z-A-R. The word itself, Zah, likely means visitation in the sense of a spirit visiting you. It can be used more generally in terms of visitation in, in Arabic, but it really is, refers to the visitation of a spirit, a, the, a spirit coming along. And I first... Uh, encountered this, I should say, in the works of a friend of mine, Jan Fries, in his book uh, Sideways, which really talks about a trans tradition within the northern tradition, the runic tradition. But before he gets into that, he kind of goes through a whole lot of different traditions around the world, a bit of anthropology, if you like, which provides him with parallels to the, the the way that he reconstructs the Nordic tradition of seder or seething. One of the chapters in that book is called Horses of the Tsar and it describes that this Middle Eastern Egyptian cult of, of the Tsar and it gives a, a little bit of, it's only a few pages long, a, li a little bit of an insight into where it comes from and the core myth of the tradition. Anyway, this is the first time that I'd ever heard of it myself. Uh, eventually, I kind of did my own research and followed up on some of the sources that he'd used and visited Egypt and was lucky enough to participate in a public performance of the, of the circus. This is still a living tradition within Egypt, which has been described by travellers to Egypt for the last couple of hundred years, really. The first books by travellers in Egypt, they always have a little section on the, on the magic and mystery of the of the folk tradition around them. Uh, and if you piece all these together, you realise they're talking about the same phenomena. The, the first encounters with this here's a typical one it, it was kind of thought of as black magic in, in that kind of pejorative term but they nevertheless wanted to write about it because this was kind of quite titillating I suppose black magic or they found black magic in in Egypt that the typical quote is within only a comparatively short period of years, says Professor MacDonald in one of these early books, quite easily within 30 years, I would say, we have come to know that practically all through the Muslim world, there is spread an observance exactly like the black mass in Christianity. That is to say, a profane parody of the sacred service. Well, you know, it would get you interested, but that's that's all uh, bullshit, basic, basically, and says more about him, the Professor MacDonald, and his attitude to 
native and folk traditions that encountered in Egypt than it does to the actual tradition itself. But still, these sort of things sell books. And you can see behind that the usual Western bias when encountering things that they don't quite understand. And the usual Christian balance, I suppose, took, assuming it's some sort of uh, perversion of the of of the Christian mass. Anyway, essentially, this is pagan material in Egypt. We're, we're talking about the Tsar. It's and it's more than that in the sense that it's it's a survival of the old Egyptian religion, the Pharaoh's, the Pharaonic religion of thousands of years uh, before the the present time that survives within within the folk tradition outside of it so it's not part of the elite tradition which has its own history of course of the conversion of egypt to uh, christianity and later islam and all the rest this is this is a, a tradition that carries on outside of it and like with any folk tradition it's very very difficult to actually date it it seems to be universal it's almost like the people carry on doing the kind of same sort of things while the the main religions of the elite and the people who run the country may come and go these things uh, continue and although some of the practices may seem unorthodox and and not the sort of things you would expect to be sanctioned by the official religion whether that be christianity or islam now these things carry on you know uh, while other things have kind of died out the the Tsar is continuing it's not you couldn't say it was thriving it's it, it may not last for very much longer but what interested me about it as someone trying to practice and revive the old Egyptian religion that here we have survivals from uh, Egyptian times so I would argue that we can participate in and have very very interesting features to them which are, I hope I'll interest in, you in. The heartland of Tsar the cult is said to be modern Sudan which in the ancient world was known as Nubia, which literally means the land of gold, uh, which has its own very interesting resonance, this idea of the land of gold. It has various cultures there. And one thing about the, the Nubians even today, but certainly in antiquity, is that they were famous as practitioners of, of sorcery. Obviously, the Egyptians themselves were famous as magicians and practitioners of of sorcery, but as with anything, they're the slightly outside people there on their borders. There's always a kind of they practice sorcery, we practice kind of good magic, if you like, or pretty so we practice white magic, they practice black magic. But at the same time, there's a there's a certain fascination with what these people were doing, and there's a uh, interchange of, of ideas between them. But it's it's often the way that people find a w way in their language of practicing magic, usually themselves, but at the same time labeling anybody else's practice as uh, somehow beyond the pale, as as black magic or or, or Maybe in the sense that we practice religion, they practice magic is a, a common way of looking at it in later later times. And I think you can't just say that the Christians do this or whatever. It, it everybody seems to do it. Originally, it was the it was Roman pagans who who said this about other types of uh, religious practitioners. Hence, the term magic itself was coined as a kind of criticism of people who weren't practicing the good old Roman religion in the, in the correct way. People have always done this and some very interesting magical practitioners such, which I've talked about before such as Zosimus of Panopolis. He also had this kind of double standard really that what he did was 
correct and according to tradition and what other practitioners did nearby even though it sounds very very interesting to us as well he, he'll say all oh, this is kind of evil really or and it's evil and also at the same time it it doesn't work it, it won't work as well as the stuff that i do so i, I would say this is kind of you human nature so we're saying about the between musical styles this idea of fusion between folk styles even now some people find it kind of strange you know that uh, or objectionable in some sense that that westerners would be interested in middle eastern folk music or you know it, it, they might even talk about people appropriating it but for these things to survive they probably do have to reach out they already have this quite unusual history in terms of fusing with other traditions and you see that in some of the the songs that people play in, in folk music even today and the instrumentation and all the rest so I it was put to me that if some of these folk traditions like the Tsar are going to survive and they've survived a long time already then they really do have to make connections with with other people uh, to fuse with other traditions so that they can uh, gain new life and grow and, and continue. In Egypt you can go to uh, public performances of, of the Tsar, the, the kind of shop window of of it in in lots of ways and there, there are even kind of more fusion elements I mean in terms of uh, fusion with modern music with rave music and with uh, trance music and all the rest and these are all ways in which the tradition which ultimately does go back to pharaonic Egypt because if you look at the sources I mean one thing I didn't go into in too much detail but because it takes you long in in the late period in Egypt itself is a a record called the Bentresh Stella. Now this is a an a, a Stella a kind of carving from the late period in Egypt that was found in the temple complex at Karnak. Not only at Karnak, it was found near the Temple of Khonsu, which. I'll, uh, we'll come back to a few, which is this uh, immense ritual complex in Luxor, which has all sorts of sub-complexes within it, one of which is the temple of, uh, of the god Khonsu. I was talking about the god, the Egyptian moon god Khonsu, <laughs> and immediately, the, even though it's winter here, the sun came blazing through the window. Uh, and I don't think you would have been able to see very much. No, perhaps that's appropriate. Anyway, I, I was talking about the Bentresh Stella, which is this late period stella that's the persian period in egypt when uh, when the persian empire had kind of conquered egypt really it's near to the end in lots of ways so that's not quite the end anyway there's this stella which tells this fascinating story really about well maybe i'll read a bit horus mighty bull So the Bentresh Delhi tells a very interesting story. I find this material fascinating, really, because the, the Bentresh Delhi, I say, from the Persian period, when the Persians ruled in, in Egypt, and where a king is approached by a a monarch from a from a neighbouring kingdom, and that, that neighbouring kingdom is is actually is called uh, Bactan, which it must be. Bactria really nobody can 
see that 100% Bactria, which is essentially is from Afghanistan and, and northern India, which just goes to show how much trade there is and in ideas and in between the two realms, which I'm coming to call the uh, East-West, really. Just call it the uh, East-West. We don't come from the West or the East. This East-West, this domain of uh, ideas and especially in terms of magic and, and whatever. So this neighbouring king sends sw swaps gifts and, and whatever, but um, basically he says that his daughter is possessed, is possessed by a spirit that nobody can do anything about. Uh, the Egyptians being very famous for their their magic, he, rather than the usual diplomatic gifts that are swapped uh, between the two kingdoms, he asked them to send a magician to uh, Bactria to deal with this possession. And essentially, the the way that he deals with it, they do send a magician and they send a special statue and all the rest, connected with the Temple of Khonsu. Khonsu has a, the remains of a very interesting mystery cult, so I always think it's amazing that they find this, this document in, in association with the, the Temple of Khonsu. So they send a special form of Khonsu to Bactria to help with this uh, case of demonic and it is basically the same it's it's not about blasting things to pieces it, it's about making some sort of uh, connection with with the spirits and and finding out what they want and dealing with it and they do that quite successfully so as i say the the heart of the Tsar ritual itself is a kind of musical performance which involves, which is paid for probably by the person who's, who's being uh, treated. So a big party, lots of food, lots of uh, specialist musicians. And there'll be a master of the Tsar who will know lots of the songs uh, and will recognise his Spirit. Once you have one spirit, which brings you to the circle, that spirit will give you knowledge of other spirits, which deal with other disease entities. Lots of this is codified, uh, it's been codified from pharaonic times, uh, and people have kind of modified that, and there's a kind of modern version of it. I, th I think the Iranian version of a much more uh, systematic set of of spirits and diseases but one way or another if you want to get a flavor of this there's a, there's an album i think you can still buy in the kind of world music label called bride of the czar which again this idea of bride of the czar you know getting get the flavor of the of the way this this thing works so in the sense the bride might be of um uh, as much a man as a as a woman who can become involved in this kind of ceremony of one sort so in the the playlist of the bride of the czar album has quite a tells you quite a lot of this this background story in in music so the first song is called uh Sawakin, which is a a town on the suit on the red sea coast uh, uh in sudan so and this, this song is a song about people longing to return so this emphasizes the idea that the heartland of the Tsar is is this place in Sudan and quite a lot of the songs at least begin with in either a kind of nostalgia for for, for a lost homeland which has brought people on this journey so there's always this awareness of that even hundreds of years after some of these things happen there also be kind of oddly there be marching songs <laughs> so this emphasis again that a lot of these people were drafted into the Egyptian army at, at some point and some of the songs do that there'll be things like traditional wedding songs 
you know usual stuff so it's kind of giving you a, a picture that's it this is uh, what what's there and I should say that often the whole thing because we're talking about you know you have to touch certain bases to get this this ritual going there'll be a kind of a Sufi song right at the beginning as the opening often a kind of Sufi singer or what we recognize as an Islamic singer will sing a kind of a prayer an Islamic prayer as the kind of opening right of the whole thing just to put it on the, on the right footing if you like okay if I just come to one of the songs in particular that I've been looking at and it's actually uh, some of this song is given in Jan Fries's book uh, Sideways but only a very very small fragment of it not enough to really get a grip up of what it was about and um, for a while we, we we did actually use some of the, the lines but he he's quoting from uh, an anthropologist N.O. Littman who who actually went a folklorist and recorded lots of the songs and translated them anyway the song has a very interesting structure which which seems to be very similar to uh, Egyptian magic and that is very pleasing and I mean might one it starts with a kind of line of of uh, text which is in Arabic but uh, could be in any language and sometimes it doesn't even make sense in in Arabic and then there'll be the congregation will respond to it so you have uh, call and response which is a very pleasing and popular form of uh, magical rhythm making that certainly you would find in the Egyptian pharaonic texts so it starts wado wade ene wado and then everybody goes ya mama so, so the frame is this is ya mama which so the person, the initiate, if it's a if it's a woman who's running the circle, she's called a mama, uh, and if it's a man, it's he's abba, father, which is not so be ya abba, so, or whatever. So there's there's this very common structure. So the song goes on and it builds up this this rhythm. Some of the words, I mean, I'm not going to go into now, but it gets to the point at, at, at some point, you know, after a while of this of calls and responses, where the singers on behalf of the person who's possessed will say, Ya Mama, forgive a little. Ya Mama, play a little. Ya Mama, Put on the headdress, the tabus. Ya mama, heal your guest. Ya mama, burn your candles. Your table is prepared. Are you a table of offerings and of food that you're going to enjoy? Ya mama, your sacrifice is paraded. A uh, goat that's going to be sacrificed and is going to form the meal for all the people at, at, at the feast and at the ritual be welcome and it's a kind of change of tone and they say put on the coat so there's a special garment then the person has to put on uh, and you're called mighty lord we wake tonight be awake tonight and you're going to heal the sick Obviously, it's going to go on a little bit longer than that with repetitions and all that. But it's one particular song where the person has to sit on a chair and they have a special piece of clothing and they're given a walking stick and all sorts of other things. Sometimes the special Tsar jewellery is given at this stage. So as I say, the song completely resembles the, the underlying structure of most spells that you'd find in the magical papyrus of Egypt, obviously brought up to date and other elements added. The the rhythm itself has a, has a very simple structure as well, which is it starts slow and then there's a fast bit, there's a slow bit and a fast bit, uh, in which people often really when when it's in the fast bits is when they go in into quite heavy trance, or when they can't take it you know which is just as an important a process where they have to withdraw 
they can't take it anymore it's not for them and this is this is important or other people they become possessed it is for them it is going to cure them it's a very interesting approach they're going to assume the god form the putting on of the clothes and the walking stick this is the moment in which they're ridden by the spirit you know it's invited to come out in and to be in the circle or they put on the ritual garment one way or another and they're welcomed and they're, and they're feasted and blessed in one way or another and at the end a healing takes place although the healing may not a, a catharsis in the sense of a yeah that's the, the the greek term for a healing a catharsis of 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 a kind of purging of the of of what is causing the problem and, and in that way some sort of healing it may not be permanent uh people often have to become part of the cult which is not such a bad thing is it is it really and they regularly uh, attend and every now and again their, their spirit will require a top up as it were uh, uh, an extra blessing or, or or to come out and to express itself express sometimes it's taboo elements and that's the way the healing takes place it's not a permanent process it's more like a a contract a pact if you like between yourself and the spirits which is not too onerous because it involves entering into this wonderful rhythmic uh, space where there is food and there is uh, alcohol and other kind of things to to is, is, is an enjoyable process but there is a, there is a healing and a, a, of some sort which may have to be have to be repeated but you can see how the structure is basically pretty clever really to say I have a lot of admiration for this system which is an amazing to find in in Egypt the survival of of obviously you can't know exactly right because we we can't see the rituals of uh, the pharaonic time as being uh, enacted but there are plenty of records uh, in terms of uh, inscriptions and pictures of people dancing in str and wearing uh, strange I suppose you'd say shamanic clothing or being bound or things being put on them in some ways for us to think that some of the same things that we that are happening in the Zara were happening in the pharaonic times and this is a, a, an immense and privileged clue we have. It's not the only one. There are lots of, once you get into this idea of looking at the folk tradition, as difficult as it is and as attenuated as it is, nevertheless, it gives us a clue into how magic is. It's a, it's a better idea of, of how magic would be performed than some of the 19th century Victorian ideas about magic which are a little bit theatrical and um, stagey in some ways a bit a bit sort of boring I, I suppose you'd say well, interesting at first if you've never done anything like this but this sort of musical it's static aspect of, of magic is something that I'm very glad has come back into into our intellectual and magical life it was, I may return to this subject later on uh, and give some samples, I think, of some of the kind of musical things that I've been talking about. But thanks for listening now. And if you are lucky enough to go to, especially to Cairo, there are at least two public performances of the Tsar cult which are open to uh, tourists and foreigners and are a very, very enjoyable evening uh, just on an entertainment level. But if you find that it speaks to you, then that's going to be important too. So stay well and thank you for listening.